I grew up in the Asia Pacific, was born in LA, and I was been back and forth. So it, I, I had always been around militarism, and we always took it second nature that Micronesia, Hawaii, Korea, Japan, that English was this international language and spoken at all these places and the dollar was the form of currency. But it wasn't until I was older that I began to see that this, this was all emblematic of imperialism and that there were a lot of really negative impacts and implications that came with that. I came to learn while I lived in Hawaii and just saw all of the contamination in the water, Pearl Harbor, the rivers, the depleted uranium and so forth. And um, it wasn't until I really got involved in the, the militarization, the military buildup in Guam in 2008, I was asked to go over there and help organize it. I really began to see that the United States was really ramping up in the beginning of this 21st century for a kind of military standoff, standoff with China, like two hegemons opposing each other for the last remaining resources on the planet. And so um, most recently I was in Okinawa. I was asked to attend a conference there. Uh, very interesting conference that was put on by a group of young people all under 30, maybe most under 25, who hail from a whole scattering of islands throughout the Asia Pacific, from Jeju Island in Korea to um, the Ryukyu Islands in Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia, Taiwan, and they had all come together to discuss how this ramping up of militarism was really impacting them socially and their environments and it was a really eye-opening experience because you were right there hearing direct stories of what was going on. Well the first day of the conference there was this seismic shift in the government because that was the day, September 19th, that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe dismantled the beloved peace constitution that General MacArthur had instituted in 1947. And what this basically meant is that now the Japanese army could fight offensively and not just defensively. Japanese troops could go into battle for the first time since World War II. The changes, called collective self-defense, allow actual combat under certain conditions. Now there was a reason that MacArthur instituted this, and that's because there is a strain in the Japanese um, national mentality that Abe represents and carries on. It's very militaristic. Their Confederate flag is the rising sun with the radiating rays and you see that around and it has a lot of really heavy implications. These are people that will not acknowledge that there were the comfort women during World War II and whatnot. It's a small percentage, but they're in charge. And, well, they're in charge for a number of reasons that I won't go into, but, you know, to put it in a nutshell, they were put into power by the U.S. After the war, these war criminals were taken out of prison and put into power for a whole lot of other reasons that I won't go into at the moment. But, in any case, that legislation that dismantled the Constitution passed the first day of the conference. So it really threw up a lot of discussion and a lot of almost panic, for lack of a better word, because there is, um, uh, it's enabled the construction of bases to go up on four different perfectly pristine, amazing islands in the Ryukyu archipelago, which is these beautiful islands that are like a chain of emeralds that go south from the lower part of Japan, 900 miles to almost to Taiwan. These bases wouldn't be able to operate if they had the old peace constitution. For example, one of them is going to be a radar surveillance base to spy on China. And um, until last month in September, and the constitution was pushed through, uh, Japan was not allowed to surveil 
outside of its own borders, for example. Um, and then there's one island that has hundreds of amazing biodiverse species, many of which are endemic only to that island. It's called Amamioshima. I was amazed to see so I've never been surrounded by so much biodiversity. 70% of this island is completely untouched, original old growth forest. Nobody goes in there because there's two venomous snakes and it's kept it totally pristine, much like the DMZ between North and South Korea. And they're going to put in a live fire uh, practice range, firing range with the depleted uranium and all of the detonations. They're putting in a missile range. In fact, three of these islands on this chain are going to be pointing missiles at China. So it's quite interesting because um, I enter all of this as an environmentalist, not as a geopolitics buff, not as uh, really strictly because when I was growing up in Guam and in Micronesia, I saw some of the most enchanting and amazing sights you could ever imagine. Uh, as you know, from being in, in Palau, They're, they've got, uh, it's the only place with a freshwater lake full of non-venomous jellyfish that you can swim with and they massage you all over. I mean, stuff like that you can only, you, you can't think of on your own. It's, and, and, and I saw this in these parts of the world and it's precisely because nobody knows about them that they've remained so untouched for so long. Right now I live in Hawaii, everybody knows about Hawaii and that's why most species are extinct in Hawaii. And so um, Amami Oshima is one of those amazing magical places that I don't want to see militarized and thus all of these, this network of life just be destroyed. So what's interesting is that Japan and the United States work together to get three things accomplished that ultimately led to the desecration of these islands and to this ramped up base building. Number one was the dismantling of the constitution. Number two was doing that led the way for a security treaty that already was ready to go. It had been cobbled into place over the past two years. And that is what would really spell out what Japan would be able to do what you know how the rubber hits the road okay we know you can now you can now attack offensively and not only in defense but stuff like mine sweeping to keep the sea lanes open um, uh, attacking ships I mean they all 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 of the specified um, activities in the new security treaty are specifically geared at maritime um, jockeying for power, stuff that's going on in the South China Sea right now. So all of this is between Japan and the US. Uh, the, the security treaty, the US-Japan security treaty, and also even the dismantling of the constitution was negotiated, believe it or not, with the TPP in the mix. There are trade concessions given on one part or the other in order for Shinzo Abe to promise on his last visit to the United States, actually he's the first Japanese Prime Minister to speak before Congress. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you His Excellency Shinzo Abe Prime Minister of Japan. And at that speech in the spring of this year, 2015, he promised Congress that he would get this legislation passed, which is pretty presumptuous because democratic process is supposed to take place. And that was part of um, some backroom deals that were made uh, regarding trade. They were a gridlock between the time they joined TPP in 2013 all the way till the beginning of this year. There was no movement and then something happened. China was developing a whole banking system and, and this was a real threat to the whole global economy and currency and banking system. So Japan and the US quickly 
hammered together an arrangement. Two days later, Obama and Abe are in the Rose Garden smiling and waving and telling everybody the TPP will be, what did they use? They, it will come to an early resolution. It will come to an early conclusion. We promise it. And, and then the next day, or right around that time, it might have been that night, Abe promised Congress that he would push through the legislation to get the Constitution dismantled. So TPP, Constitution, U.S. Security Treaty, they're all wrapped up. And um, why do I know this? Because I care so much about the islands and the beautiful coral and butterflies and things I've never seen before outside of that region, you know, and, and all of the wonderful ecosystems and reefs. Uh, and, and, and it's all of these machinations that have led domino by domino, step by step, to what we have now. And what's their reasoning? All, everything's geared towards subordinating China. The TPP, where China's excluded, and they're writing their own set of rules. And this alliance between Japan, which is a traditional historic enemy of China, and the U.S., who has to be number one, right? We, we can't conceive of a world where we're not number one. If you look at the map of the Asia-Pacific, if you look at the Moluccan Strait, it's a little tiny passage straight under Indochina. And it's through this tiny little passage that's only 50 miles across in some spots at its narrowest, that all the oil from the Middle East comes through there and goes up to China, South Korea, Japan. It also passes through the South China Sea. So whoever controls this choke point, controls the economy of Asia, which in turn drives the economy of the world. This is like a key power point. So if you look at this, and then you look at the countries involved in the TPP, well, the countries involved in the TPP are Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, and they're all right around the Strait of Malacca, and Japan to the north, Australia, and New Zealand to the south. Those are all the Asia-Pacific countries. If you're going to have a huge trade pact, where is, where is Indonesia? Where is South Korea? Where is India? It doesn't make any sense. And then you look at the other side, on the South American side, you've got Chile, which is uh, a, a huge exporter of wines. And then on the Pacific, you've got Brunei, which is a Muslim country where I believe drinking is illegal. It doesn't make any sense from an economic point of view. But then if you look at it from a geopolitical point of view, it makes perfect sense. Because what has happened is that the U.S., once the TPP is in place, it's a template for a kind of a set of rules of trade where then those countries around the Strait of Malacca, who are having territorial disputes with China, can use the U.S. muscle, uh, and in exchange they will defer to U.S. hegemony in the region. And as soon as the U.S. can get the TPP in place, they've basically locked in a whole control system by which all the countries in the region will be obliged and hopefully happy to follow from the U.S. point of view. So none of this could have happened if Japan didn't get involved with the TPP. But Japan's very significant. Obviously, uh, Japan is one of our closest allies, uh, and the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, is the central uh, foundation for uh, our regional security and uh, so much of what we do in the Pacific region. My concern is for not just the environment, that's my entry point, but as I've become more uh, aware of the people involved and these young people that I met at this conference, I realized that this is a dynamic, fabulous force that we have here, but they're really, really repressed by their government. The Japanese and the South Korean and the Taiwanese governments, which are client states of the U.S., 
don't give these people any room for true democracy because they just follow the State Department and the U.S. and the Pentagon's game plan. And I think we need to support them because if we support them, they're the people that can make change in their country happen. We really can't. It's not our country, but we're responsible for the oppression in their country. So if we can support their freedom of democracy, they will do the right thing. They'll take down the nuclear power plants. They'll deal with contamination. They'll deal they'll stop the export of of weapons in their country. For example, another thing this the, this dismantled constitution does is it allows Japan to manufacture and export weapons of destruction, which has never happened. That's why instead of having um, tanks, which are being manufactured now, we had Walkmans and Honda cars, but now we're going to have drones and tanks and fighter jets. And um, that's because the old guard is in charge and we need to really support these young people whose futures are at stake. I hope everybody watching this can understand that the most important thing right now is to support these young people in Asia because they're the ones that are going to change their country, not us. Even though it's the U.S. who has led to their oppression, even though their countries are client states of the U.S., they're the ones that are going to overcome the kind of um, lack of, of uh, democratic voice that's required to get rid of the nuclear power plants, to clean up the contamination, to stop the export of, of, of arms. That's what they want. They want to save their homes, and the more support we can give them, the, the stronger the whole planet will be for it. Since all the state, since all the state, since all the state, since all the state.